This video is brought to you by Ridge's latest product, the Ridge Key Case. You streamlined your wallet experience. Now it's time to get rid of that messy, noisy key bulge. Click the link below to get a special discount or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, I hope you appreciate the sacrifice that goes into this show each week. Right now, I could be living the dream playing Forza Hot Wheels, but no, here we are to talk about the news. Look how fun this looks. But instead, we've got to talk about that dumbass EA CEO who called developers fucking idiots. And we have to have our hearts broken by Tony Hawk's NFT grift. That one really hurt. Like a band-aid or waxing your most intimate regions, it's best to rip it off fast. So let's get right to it, shall we? Here comes the news. Let's start off with some Sony Pony news. Don't worry, Xbox, I've got some good stuff for you coming soon. This week, Sony announced the existence of a new loyalty program. It's called Stars, which means the PlayStation fans can now say, Come on, I'm a member of Stars. In fact, Austin, set the rest of this block to the Marvel vs. Capcom 2 OST. I'm in the mood. Nice. Okay, where were we? Ah uh, yes, stars. It's free to join and quote, once you become a member, you'll earn rewards by completing a variety of campaigns and activities. Our monthly check-in campaign simply requires you to play any game to receive a reward, while other campaigns require you to win tournaments, earn specific trophies, or even be the first player to platinum a blockbuster title in your local time zone, end quote. Doing all of this stuff will earn you points, which you can redeem in a specific PSN catalog that may include actual wallet funds as well as select titles. You can also earn and purchase just digital collectibles and when everyone saw this they were like oh hell no because it sounded like nfts but they're not nfts sony clarified that they're just little digital items you can collect like digital figurines or whatever not something that most of us would care about i don't think but the collectors amongst you might get a kick out of this one anyway stars gets going later this year i'll keep you posted sony completed not one but two acquisitions this week the first was for haven the newly created studio led by jade raymond of assassin's creed fame she famously went on to leave Google Stadia's game making efforts before Google did the old rug pull, shuttering all of their first party development before anyone even had the time to make anything. Raymond's impressive CV allowed her to spin up her own studio and Sony have so much faith in that studio that they just bought it outright. A sign of not only how talented Raymond is, but also how fiercely the war for developer talent is being fought. No word yet on when we can expect an actual release from this studio, but you get the sense that it isn't anytime soon. The other acquisition that was finalized this week was for Destiny developer Bungle, who Sony purchased just at the start of the year for a cool $3.6 billion. This deal took absolutely everyone by surprise, except for me, who accidentally predicted it in a tweet. Still my finest hour. With the sale finalized, Bungie can now get on with its important work, making Destiny content so it can then remove that content three years later. <laughs> I'm laughing, but trust me, it's gallows humor. Bungie were in the headlines recently for suing a Destiny 2 YouTuber who was abusing the copyright strike system. This dude was a member of the Destiny music community and he was feigning indignation that someone would dare strike all of these Destiny 2 YouTubers when all the while it was him doing the striking. Well, Bungie struck back with a multi-million dollar lawsuit that will not only end this dude's financial future, but will hopefully serve as a warning to other bad faith actors looking to try something similar. Bungie's lawyers were just getting warmed up on that one though, as this week they announced they were filing suit against a different Destiny 2 streamer. This one accused of fraud, cheating, and harassment. Twitch streamer Miffy's World has allegedly been repeatedly banned by Bungie for using cheat software, creating 13 different accounts to sidestep the ban so he could continue cheating. Bungie also alleges that Miffy's World has threatened Bungie's staff, saying he wants to burn down Bungie's offices, and commenting that one of Bungie's staff members was, quote, not safe, end quote, after Miffy's World planned to move into that staff member his neighborhood. Critically, the suit alleges that Miffy's World was part of an account hacking and selling forum, which breaches Bungie's copyright since that activity profits from Destiny as an IP. The lawsuit seeks damages that are in the hundreds of thousands at the low end, topping out at potentially millions depending on how the trial goes. Personally, I'm rooting for Bungie because this guy's rap sheet is fucked, and if this suit could deter others from following him down that similar path, then that's a big win in my book. Last bit of Sony news for the week, and it's another acquisition actually, only this time it's for an esports platform rather than for a game studio. This week, Sony snapped up Repeat.gg, a platform that hosts leaderboards for online tournaments, with over 2.3 million players served since the company set up shop. 
The investment folds neatly into Sony's previous acquisition of the EVO Fighting Games tournament, demonstrating that Sony certainly have long-term plans in the esports space, even if their current portfolio of exclusive games doesn't really service that segment yet. Xbox, I promised you some sugar and here it is, but be aware that it is not of the video game variety, but rather video game adjacent. This week we got word on two TV shows based on Xbox properties that are at various stages of production. The first was for that Amazon Prime produced Fallout TV show led by actor Walton Goggins. It's a very video game name by the way, so I feel like there's a great casting on multiple levels. The show has begun filming and a few photographs of the set have leaked. I can't show them here as I don't want to get sued, but if you do some goggling, hey, you'll find them relatively easily. The images show the Super Duper Mart, a location in Fallout 3 that apparently has made its way into the TV show. Given the filming and post-production schedule, it's likely we'll be seeing the Fallout TV show toward the back end of next year. The other Xbox TV show announcement is for something rather unexpected, Grounded. Deadline report that the game, which was initially inspired by Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, is getting an animated TV show adaptation, and it's being written by Brent Friedman, one of the writers behind the Star Wars Clone Wars series. No word yet on if Rick Moranis will appear as a voice in the series, but it feels like it'd be a wasted opportunity if he didn't. Xbox aren't the only ones going balls deep on the whole TV adaptation front. Every publisher is getting in on the action, including Nintendo, who this week announced that they've acquired animation studio Dynamo Pictures to help convert their game properties into TV shows and movies. We don't have any details on this one yet, but we can surely expect to see more Nintendo characters voiced by unexpected actors. Chris Pratt was just the start. Get ready for uh, Meryl Streep as Peach and uh, Benedict Cumberbatch as Donkey Kong. And of course, Amy Schumer as Samus. Everyone's gonna love that one. Briefly, if you want to grab any last-minute 3DS or Wii U titles on the Nintendo eShop, then now's your last chance. Nintendo flagged some time back that they were shutting those storefronts down, and come March 27th next year, that'll go into effect. You'll still be able to access previously purchased titles by some means, but no new purchases can be made, sadly dooming a number of digital-only titles to permanent deletion. Thank God for the emulation scene, or those titles would have been permanently lost to history. The fight against loot boxes continues, and video game publishers have found a new ally in their fight, the Tories. A while back, the UK government began gathering submissions relating to loot boxes, their societal risks, and their links to problem gambling. For the last two years, the UK Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport worked to compile a comprehensive report that was just handed down, and it did find that people who purchased loot boxes were more likely to experience, quote, gambling, mental health, financial, and problem gaming related harms, end quote. They also noted that the risks posed were greater for children and young people. Okay then, here we go. A government report clearly linking loot boxes and gambling, saying that children in particular are vulnerable. Surely that's something that politicians of any persuasion can get behind, right? Never underestimate the craptitude of the Tories, who rejected calls for legislation on the matter and instead called for industry-led solutions. Ah yes, because we can absolutely trust the companies making billions off this to police themselves so that they start making less money. Absolutely. As one expert put it, it's like the fox guarding the hen house. A very British but very apt analogy. It's disappointing to see the UK government whiff this so badly when other nations like Belgium and the Netherlands are pressing ahead with regulation on this front, and Spain has also signaled its intent along with a number of consumer agencies across the EU. Hopefully this creates a groundswell of action that becomes too large to ignore, but if that is to happen, it's likely to be a frustratingly slow process. One company that profits handsomely from getting kids to gamble is EA, who this week secured a sinister new patent. This one seeks to categorize players into broad buckets like competitive, explore, Explorer, completionist, etc. And then it looks to tailor ads that might appeal to that type of player, suggesting games or products that might appeal to a completionist versus a competitive player, whatever. They didn't provide any specifics on how this might be used, and hey, maybe it never gets used. But it sounds really shitty. If I want targeted advertising pointed at me, I want it to be because my phone is eavesdropping on all of my conversations, not based on my KD or my trophy count. That's an invasion of privacy and it's taken things too far. Before Android Wilson, EA was led by one John Richtiello. Those were the golden years for EA where it rode high as the most hated company in America and began shuttering studios after purchasing them just years prior for hundreds of millions of dollars. This dude was essentially fired from his job for tanking EA's performance, but like most CEOs, he was able to land another job as a CEO, this time of Unity, the graphics engine most commonly used by the indie dev scene. 
Recently, Richard Tiello did an interview where he talked about an acquisition Unity made of a company that has a pretty checkered past, and in that interview, he was speaking about developers who did not seek to implement monetization in the creative process of making games. Quote, It's a very small portion of the gaming industry that works that way, and some of these people are my favorite people in the world to fight with. They're the most beautiful and pure, brilliant people. They're also some of the biggest fucking idiots, end quote. I can't believe that a former CEO of EA would say that. I'm truly shocked. Sure enough, the quote generated the predictable backlash, leading Richard Tiello to publicly apologize. It's really long-winded and annoying to read, but it can basically be translated to, I'm sorry that the mask momentarily slipped. It won't happen again. We'll see, John. We will see. Turning to some good news now, Tenacon 2022 happened this past weekend and it was a pretty awesome celebration for a variety of reasons. Firstly, Warframe is still going strong with lots of new content being added in the form of the Daviri Paradox and Veilbreaker, which each add new gameplay elements and expand Warframe's already voluminous lore. Earlier, Digital Extremes had mentioned that they were looking to deliver cross-play and cross-save to the franchise and they're now ready to move into a testing phase for those things, so you can expect that soon. There's also a mobile port in the way, which I don't think I knew about, but it does make a hell of a lot of sense since it feels like Warframe's quick session-based gameplay would work extremely well on mobile. Finally, and most exciting of all, Digital Extreme announced that for the first time in over 10 years, they're working on a new IP. And they didn't just announce it, they showed it. This is Soulframe. Bit of a funny name, but it's described as a fantasy-based MMORPG. When talking about the game, creative director Steve Sinclair said that he's long dreamed of creating a fantasy epic, and after 10 years leading the Warframe IP, he's now moving over to create something new. Who's stepping into his enormous shoes? A small person, at least in stature, but absolutely not in talent because Comdev lead Reb Ford is an absolute powerhouse, leading an incredible team of people who together built one of the best communities across all the video games. Ford will take over the role of creative director for the game, leading it into its next chapter while Digital Extremes continues to expand to new platforms and IPs. Fantastic choice for the job and just a really inspiring arc for someone so deserving. Hey, do you guys remember that time when I fed Reb and Megan Vegemite and Reb threw up? No? Well, luckily we filmed it. Mm. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be off camera for reactions. That's what people came for. <laughs> if you're someone that enjoyed Red Dead Online 2, well, I've got some great news for you. Wait, that's a typo. I have some terrible news for you. It's dead. Roughly one year ago, Rockstar put out a major content update for Red Dead Online, which it turned out was to be its very last. Rockstar just announced that they were moving resources away from Red Dead Online and toward GTA 6, with Red Dead only getting minimal content in the form of new Telegram missions. This is a huge blow to the loyal and vocal community who have been pleading for months for something, anything, to give them hope about a game mode that they truly love despite its ludicrous monetization. All told, it's rumored that Rockstar has now canceled a GTA 4 and Red Dead 1 remaster, a Red Dead 2 next-gen port, and Red Dead 2 online support, Also, they compile every available resource into GTA 6. So that game had better be pretty damn good, or there's gonna be a lot of really pissed off people. Finally, we got some interesting news about the future of Assassin's Creed. Last week, YouTuber ACG posted on Twitter that the next Assassin's Creed game would be Aztec-themed, leading Jason Schreier to respond in the Gaming Leaks and Rumors subreddit that this wasn't the case, and the next AC would be set in Baghdad. Jeff Grubb then chimed in during his Game Mess podcast, where he confirmed that his sources also indicate a Middle Eastern setting for the game. So that's looking pretty locked in, given that these two are very reliable with the information they put out there. That Middle Eastern setting title is coming this year, and it's a more traditional Assassin's Creed game. The one that comes later is the live service Assassin's Creed Infinity. To this point, we've had no word on setting, but in the same podcast, Jeff Grubb said that his sources are indicating a Japan setting, a setting that players have been begging for for years. If correct, it puts Ubisoft in an awkward spot because they have to find a way to outdo Ghost of Tsushima, which is basically already Assassin's Creed Japan. I don't know how they do that, but 
I wish them all the luck in the world. Let's do a quick lightning round to finish off. PlayStation exclusive game making platform Dreams is hosting DreamCon 2022 on July 26th. It's a showcase of all the cool shit people have made in Dreams and it should be interesting because people can make some absolutely crazy shit in Dreams. Speaking of festivals, Steam is hosting a VR fest right now. It's like the Steam Next Fest, only it's focused on VR titles. So if you're keen to see what's new and check out some demos, then this is for you. Vampire The Masquerade Bloodlines 2 is apparently still in development and it's in good hands. That's according to the game's publisher Paradox Interactive, who had to fire the previous developer and reallocate the project. No details on this yet, but it's still coming, apparently. Yakuza 8 has just been confirmed. Famitsu has the scoop and they were kind enough to show off a few over-the-shoulder screenshots, though they didn't give away too much except for a new Ichiban hairdo. The highly anticipated Skate reboot is going free to play. I don't love this. I would have happily paid for a cool skate game that just has all the things included. But now I guess we gotta go through EA's cash shop to buy anything good. I'm still glad that skate exists, but yeah, I don't think this is great news. Speaking of bad skate related news, Tony Hawk is getting in on the NFT grift. I know, it broke my heart too, but sadly Superman himself is teaming up with some bullshit Ethereum whatchamacallit thingo where you can buy land in the metaverse and everything is an NFT and I don't fucking know. The point is, this is what happens when you cancel the Tony Hawk 3 and 4 remasters, so Bobby Kotick, this is entirely on you. So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, we'll tick off a few smaller items first. Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2 is headed to PC and consoles July 20th. The first game got a re-release for modern hardware a little while back, and now the sequel is getting the same treatment. This was pretty much the best console-based ARPG back in the day since Diablo never made its way to PS2. Not sure how well it'll hold up in the modern era, but I guess we can find out now. Last week we learned that Inscription will be getting a release on PlayStation consoles, and now we have an official date, August 30th. This one is full of surprises, so best to go in as blind as you can. And actually, Souls Like, I've been keeping an eye on for a while now. Thymesia has a little bit of buzz behind it, owing to some very slick looking gameplay. I've heard mixed things about how well it actually plays, but we'll be able to suck it and see when it arrives exclusive to PC on August 18th. Here's something we didn't see coming. Another Aliens horror game is in the works. After Creative Assembly vacated the field to make that hero shooter thing they're making, at least one developer has stepped in to fill the void. Developer Servios have announced they're making a quote, intense single player action horror game set in the iconic Alien universe, end quote. It's set between the Alien and Aliens films where a quote, battle-hardened veteran has a vendetta against the Xenomorphs, end quote. Kind of funny using the word vendetta when talking about xenomorphs. Like, did Ripley have a vendetta against them? I guess, but it's still weird to call it that. Anyway, the game is as yet untitled, but it's being developed for console, PC, and VR. No release date, of course, but don't expect it anytime soon. A little title I'm increasingly interested in is Rumbleverse. This is a wrestling battle royale, and while I'm not a wrestling dude, it's kind of hard to argue that this doesn't look low-key awesome. I've seen plenty of people playing this during its beta tests, and everyone seems to be having a blast. Sadly, I wasn't able to get in, but I'll have my chance along with everyone else when the game launches on August 11th free to play and exclusive to the Epic Games launcher. Another free to play title that got a release date this week was Multiverses, the Warner Brothers themed smash like brawler that's shoulder charging its way into an increasingly crowded smash like subgenre. To its credit, Multiverses has been getting great feedback during its previous test windows and the expansive cast of characters all fully voiced is hard to say no to. So there's probably gonna be at least one or two characters you'll be interested in taking for a spin. Best of all, the barrier to entry for this is non-existent because like I said, it is free to play. You can actually access it right now if you buy an early access pack thing, but come the 26th, it's gonna be an open beta available to anyone and it's hitting all platforms but the Switch. No More Heroes 3 was exclusive to the Switch when it launched last year. The title didn't set the world on fire in terms of critical reception, but fans of the series really love this one. This is a very offbeat niche franchise, so it's nice to see that it keeps rolling. The Switch exclusivity period is wrapping up because on October 11th, it'll be available on all platforms, including the PC. Two big Nintendo announcements, both of which relate to Nintendo's most sexually suggestive characters. First up, we have Mr. Mouth Mode himself, Kirby, whose penchant for swallowing cannot be satiated by traffic cones and cars alone, and now he turns his gaping more toward an even more swallowable substance. 
food. Kirby's Dream Buffet is a newly announced title that appears to be a collection of co-op and competitive minigames, the goal of which revolves around eating as much as possible so you can become the fattest of all the Kirbys. It's a game I can well and truly relate to after two and a half years of COVID lockdowns. This looks like good, wholesome, positive body image affirming fun, and it's out northern summer this year. And finally, if there are any Christians in the audience, you may want to avert your eyes because she will take on other sexier, basically naked forms. Bayonetta 3 just got a release date October 28th, exclusive to Nintendo Switch, of course. The long, long-awaited sequel to the trend-setting, high-heeled, hair-twirling, clothes-disappearing character action game Bayonetta 3 has had a somewhat titillating development process, with fans often wondering if the game was stuck in some sort of development hell. Clearly, it has not been, at least from the looks of this trailer, which is looking fantastic, and it introduces a new character to the mix. If you're someone that's found Bayonetta a little too risque for your taste and you were just looking for some good, clean fun without the omnipresent threat of a nip slip, Platinum have got you covered since they've announced the inclusion of the Naive Angel mode, which takes all the things we love about Bayonetta and... Yeah, it just takes them. It, it takes them away. I have no idea why anyone would want to play this game mode, but I guess it'll come in handy in case you need to play this game while you're like mother or girlfriend or priest are in the room. I don't know, man. It's so weird. Why does this exist? So what came out last week? Well, we had that Loop Mancer game, which I showcased a while back. It's a very pretty looking title, but sadly it appears as though the concerns about the gameplay side of things were well founded. The game is currently sitting at a mixed 65% on Steam, with a lot of those negative reviews calling out floaty gameplay and some frustrating difficulty spikes. Critics are a little more forgiving, putting the game at a fair 74 on Open Critic. Digital Chumps scored this one a 7.5 and said, quote, Loop Mancer has difficulty committing to the hallmarks of better roguelites, making progression a chore, but past the questionable localization and writing is an action-focused platformer with personality and a few good ideas, end quote. Only other thing to circle back on from last week is Escape Academy, that co-op escape room game that hit all platforms bar the Switch. Predictably, this one has done very well for itself indeed, sitting at a meaty 89% very positive on Steam and a strong 80 on Open Critic. GameSpot were a little cool on it, saying, quote, Escape Academy takes design inspiration from real-world escape rooms for better and for worse, end quote. But GameSpew had a ball, scoring it a 9 out of 10 and saying, quote, Escape Academy may be a fairly brief experience for some then, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the puzzles here are thought-provoking and masterfully crafted. They test your ability to spot patterns and problem solve without ever being too obtuse, throw in a surprisingly engaging story and co-op, and you have one of the most enjoyable experiences of the year so far, end quote. So what's coming out this week? You know, actually quite a bit. I'd thought that this July, August period was a little on the quiet side, and it is, but this week is sort of the exception to that, with a great mix of new releases, ports, and DLC, all of which are worth talking about. Kicking things off is As Dusk Falls, which arrived yesterday exclusive to PC and Xbox. It's day one on Game Pass. This is a narrative-led experience, a day in the life tale inspired by the likes of Fargo, where ordinary people start making some bad choices and find themselves on the wrong side of, well, everyone and everything. It's playable with up to eight people through the use of a smartphone app, which is nice. Interesting concept that appears to have been well executed since critics are putting it at a strong 77 on Open Critic. Eurogamer recommended it, saying, quote, an interactive movie that tells a memorable story of human choices, end quote. IGN loved it, scoring it a 9 out of 10 and saying, quote, As Dusk Falls' interactive crime drama is a masterwork of branching storytelling where decisions matter and repeated playthroughs are rewarded with even more revelations, end quote. Masterwork's a strong word, but Game Rant did not share that view, scoring it a 2 out of 5 stars and saying, quote, Interactive drama game As Dusk Falls has a strong start, but it's quickly bogged down by pacing issues and an uninteresting second half, end quote. Honestly, hadn't planned on putting a lot of time into this one since I'd heard mixed things during the preview cycle, but I'm actually way more interested after reading so many positive reviews. So big props to the dev team for pulling this one off, since this is their debut title, and it's always nice to see new studios landing big Ws like this. Endling Extinction is Forever is another title that dropped yesterday, this one arriving on all platforms. It's the first of two games releasing this week where you play as a regular ass animal. Sand superpowers or sunglasses or cheeky catchphrases. Here you play as a mama fox taking care of her cubs with the added pressure of being the last foxes in existence, so you better not screw that up, mama fox. This looks really nice actually, definitely existing in that narrative-led 2D exploration experience space. Games like Limbo or Inside or Gris, great fodder for the Switch or the Steam Deck. Just briefly, that Into the Breach mobile port released yesterday on Netflix. If you're one of the six people still subscribed to Netflix, you can access the game through the Netflix app on your phone, which will then bounce you to a specific download 
page on the iOS or Android stores, so you can now experience this Tactics Classic on the go. Here's something else that's awesome and dropped yesterday, Forza Horizon 5's Hot Wheels expansion. I am ridiculously excited for this. I'm not a huge racing game fan, but I enjoyed Horizon 5 when it dropped last year, and I really enjoyed Hot Wheels Unleashed, which also dropped last year. This combines those two things, the incredible polish and cutting edge presentation of Forza with the ridiculous loop-de-loop -loop shenanigans of Hot Wheels. I can't imagine how this won't be awesome, and I'm definitely gonna be dumping a bunch of hours into it this week. Sadly, this is not being made available through Game Pass. This is paid DLC for both Xbox and PC, which you can get either standalone or as part of Horizon 5's Premium or Deluxe Editions. Finally, the other controller cute animal game to be released this week is Stray, which landed on its feet yesterday, exclusive to PlayStation and PC. This is a cat game where you walk around as a cat doing nice cat things like helping people and destroying furniture with your claws. It's only about four and a half hours long, but there's some more to do in there if you want to get all the collectibles. I was fortunate enough to have reviewed this one early and I got to tell you, I loved it. I really did. As I mentioned in my review, I do not like cats, but Stray absolutely won me over with its simple but effective cat-based gameplay, its gorgeous world design, its thrifty but charming story, and its excellent soundtrack. For real, one of the best soundtracks of the year, actually. The PC port is a little shaky, unfortunately, so this is best enjoyed on the PS5. But yeah, great game, and another one of those debut Ws since it's the first game from Blue 12 Studio. Just in case you think I'm alone in this take, I am not. Reviews hit for this last night, and critics put it at a mighty 84 on Open Critic, which is very impressive. PC Gamer enjoyed it, scoring it at 82, saying, quote, Simple polished systems allow Stray's rich fiction and charismatic star to shine, end quote. If you want to learn more about this one, I'll leave a link to my review below the like button. But don't forget that this one is sort of free on PS Plus this month, so if you have a PS4 or 5, you'll be able to check it out on the cheap that way. Two other quick releases to shout out this week. The first is Bright Memory, which was earlier available for PC and last-gen consoles. But come the 21st, it'll be available for next-gen consoles and the Nintendo Switch. Not sure how the Switch is going to handle this one, so that'll be interesting. Finally, Live Alive arrives on the Switch on the 22nd. This one has plenty of hype behind it, as it's a beloved JRPG from back in 1994. Those who played it back then say it was top tier and well ahead of its time, and Nintendo seems to agree since they've published the remaster in conjunction with Square Enix. This time-bending, generation-spanning adventure tells a number of interconnected stories that bring together different time periods, settings, and combat styles. There's a demo out for it right now if you'd like to try before you buy, and your progress is carried over to the full game, so that's great. Put this on your radar. One title I was disappointed to have missed during the recent Steam Next Fest was this one, The Tarnishing of Juxtia. This one was doing the rounds on subreddits and Twitter and everyone that got their hands on it said they had a really great time. This falls into that burgeoning category of 2D dark fantasy action RPGs, stuff like Blasphemous and Death's Gambit and Salt and Sanctuary, games that all take the core elements of the Souls-like experience and deliver them through more linear 2D gameplay. For the most part, the quality bar for those sorts of titles has remained pretty high, and Juxtia looks like it's on track to hit that, with some beautiful art, some distinctive marionette-style character animations, and some intriguing world design. I always like digging into these sorts of games. Not all of them click with me, but I'm always interested to see how this little subgenre continues to expand and evolve. The Tarnishing of Juxtia is being made by actual nerds, that's the name of the studio, by the way, I'm not having a dig. And it's actually releasing next week, July 26th, to be precise. If you'd like to wishlist it, then you can find a link to it on my Steam Curator page, which has links to all the other Put This On Your Radar titles I've profiled. I'll leave a link to that Curator page below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and how about those Prime Day deals last week? A free copy of Need for Speed Heat, Grid Legends, and Mass Effect Legendary were on offer, so I hope you managed to get those before they disappeared. What can you get for sort of free this week? Epic are back as per usual, but they really seem to have blown their load during that sale a few weeks back since the most recent offerings haven't exactly been top tier. I mean, this week you can get some in-game items for a game called Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms, as well as something called Wonder Boy the Dragon's Trap, Commencing July 22nd, you'll be able to get some more in-game items for something called Shop Titans, which apparently is a free-to-play shopkeeping simulator. The other one is Tannenberg, which is a World War I-themed first-person shooter released back in 2019. It's more realistic and committed to the history than the likes of Battlefield, and it supports up to 64 players. So if you're a history buff, then this one might be for you. The newly refreshed PlayStation Plus is beginning to settle into a rhythm of releases for its extra and deluxe tiers. If you're on the extra or deluxe package, you'll get access to Stray as a day one release, 
release, as well as to Final Fantasy VII Integrate, which is totally awesome, and Marvel's Avengers, which is totally not. There's some Assassin's Creed games thrown in there to get us in the mood for Skull and Burns, I guess, as well as two Saints Row titles to get us all warmed up for the Saints Row reboot launching next month. Not a bad lineup, but I still think we're going to need to give the new PS Plus a little more time before it fully hits its stride. Game Pass is having a bit of a quiet one this week, though it is serving up as Dusk Falls as a day one release, which is nice. Outside of that, we're looking at some older titles. Stuff like Planescape Torment, Spiritual Successor Torment, Tides of Numenera, Inside and Watch Dogs 2. PC subscribers get Sins of a Solar Empire Rebellion, and racing fans get their hands on MotoGP 2022. Our feel-good story for the week goes back to the most recent Steam Next Fest. Unbeknownst to me, a Valve employee by the name of Claire Hummel thought it would be funny to create a bunch of fake video game art and hide it amongst the regular indie listings just to see if anyone would spot it. With the Next Fest concluded, she took to Twitter to reveal the fruits of her labor and they did not disappoint. Ask yourself, did you spot Pro Poker Amateur? Custard Castle Small Claims Court? Dead Seagull Zoo Magnate? Bass Ain't Bitin' 2022, and my personal favorites, Get the King to the Toilet, and Hold in Your- <laughs> Hold in Your Farts, Could You Be the Next Champion? Now that I know this hidden ARG exists, I'm just gonna be clicking on every single sus Steam listing I see, hoping that I can find them all. Thank you, Claire. You have successfully gamified video games. You done it. All right, nerds, you know the drill, the like button. It isn't gonna like itself. That subscribe button, it longs for your gentle caress. And that notification bell, uh, it's time to ring a ding ding. I have a pretty big preview coming up over the weekend, so the notification bell will make sure you won't miss that one. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you as always for stopping by and a big thank you to this week's sponsor, The Ridge Key Case. By this point, we've all seen Ridge Wallet somewhere, whether it's here on this channel or elsewhere across the intertube, since Ridge are very big into the whole influencer marketing thing. They get good people spruiking their products because they make good stuff. The Ridge Wallet is an excellent wallet, the one I've been using for years because it has top tier build quality and it solves a problem that always pissed me off. Big bulky wallets that take up too much space in your pocket and look terrible. So it makes a lot of sense that Ridge have turned their attention to the other big bulky thing in your pocket, your keys. And with the new Ridge key case, you'll never again go back to carrying around a big bulky noisy set of keys. I mean, here's my old set. It's not that big, not that terrible, but there's enough of them here that they never felt comfortable in my pocket. And these are my keys now, all safely and neatly stored away in the Ridge key case. When I need one, I just rotate it out and around. It's super easy to do that, by the way. When I'm done, I just push it back down and we're back to that sleek, minimalist profile. That's not only really comfortable, but I think it just looks way better, especially when put next to my Ridge wallet. The Ridge key case supports two to six keys. It comes in six different color options, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. And Ridge are so confident that you're gonna love this that they're offering a full 45 day satisfaction guarantee. So if you try it out and you don't like it, you just get your money back, easy. Best of all, Ridge are offering a 10% discount to viewers of this channel using off code SKILLUP at checkout. Click the link below or visit ridge.com forward slash SKILLUP. That's ridge.com forward slash SKILLUP and offer code SKILLUP at checkout for 10% off your purchase. Thanks Ridge for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.